Thank you, Steve, and thank you for being here. I'm, it's a joy for me to be here and an honor. First of all, I'd like to kind of clarify a couple of things. I'm, I'm writing about some pretty serious, I'm speaking about some pretty serious topics, cancer, heart disease, global warming, and water scarcity. First of all, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a scientist. Um, I'm, I kind of refer to myself as, as the big picture guy. I, I like to get things organized and figure out what's most important. Steve kind of alluded to that just now, talking about our book, which is basically trying to put as much information in a small package so people can understand it. So my background is a career business executive. I have a degree in engineering where we try to figure things out. We don't try to mess with the system until we understand the whole system in engineering. And in my case, I started out this journey in terms of how do, how do I go from Ralph Lauren to uh, talking about food and environment. In fact, somebody told me I should have entitled my first book uh, From Polo to Plant Food. I would have sold a lot more books. <laughs> but in, in my case, I, I guess I just got serious, uh, curious about what is the optimal diet for humans. That took place in 2002. I won't go into the background of why I got curious, but I did. And so I, I started studying it. And I got online and, and found a few books, and Amazon said people had bought this book, bought these 10 books, and so I bought those 10 books. <laughs> and by uh, six months later, I'd read about 30 or 40 books. We're talking about 2003 now. And during that time, I discovered T. Colin Campbell long before he wrote the China study. And after six months of study, I'd concluded, okay, I'm pretty confident that the whole food, plant-based diet is the way to go. And then I read two more books over, the, over Memorial Day weekend in 2003, one by John Robbins, Diet for a New America, and one by Howard Lyman, Mad Cowboy. You may have heard of at least one of those books. I have sent, met, since met both of those guys and most of the other people in this whole field. But that weekend, I realized, after reading all that they had to say about the environmental impact and social impact of, of what we're doing, the way we're eating, I, I had what I call my blinding flash of the obvious, and I said, oh my God, we're eating the wrong food. We humans are eating the wrong food. And that's when I started really um, accelerating my study. I decided to write a book. Uh, long about 2004 because I wanted to pull everything together so people could easily understand this big picture that I was talking about. And then Colin Campbell came out with his book in January of 05 and I said, how can I top that? I can't, I can't write a book after the China study. But I did, did eventually write the book Healthy Eating, Healthy World. It came out in 2011. So in my case, I like to, I uh, said I like to get to the big picture. I like to simplify things uh, so that eighth graders can understand it if they read it carefully. And uh, in, in, in doing that, I, I think I try to get to a, a bigger audience than I ever could. So today, I'm going to change up the, the sequence here just a little bit, and I'm going to start with heart disease. I'm going to go to climate change, I'm going to go to water scarcity, and then I'm going to save cancer for last. And the reason is because I have recently started writing a book, this book about cancer, with a medical doctor in Ireland, and I've, I've kind of done a lot of research, and I don't want to spend all my time up front talking about cancer and shortchange the other ones. So, so what do heart disease, climate change, water shortage and cancer have in common. I call it MDEF from 6 o'clock on the, on the chart there. Uh, meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. Meat, dairy, eggs, and fish have a lot to do with all of those problems happening and the removal of replacement of meat, dairy, egg, and fish with plant-based alternatives have a lot to do with solving all those problems. That's in a nutshell what they have in in common. So in the next hour or so I'm going to try to explain why I believe, again I'm not a scientist or medical doctor but I've done my own study, 
why I believe that eating mostly whole plants is the only way to reverse heart disease, the only way to stop climate change, the only way to solve the water crisis, and the only way, likely the only way to tame cancer, because there's not much science on that yet, but I believe that. And over the course of my study, the main thing that I eventually concluded was that our food choices in the 21st century are the most important topic in the history of humanity. And, and that's all about sustainability, and I'll talk a lot about that later, but I want to start up front by sharing this simple four-point slide that to me says it all. We have four grossly unsustainable situations facing the world. Three of them, overpopulation. We're adding 200, over 200,000 people a day. Just during this conference, we'll add over 2 million people to the population of the world. Overconsumption. Now this is a huge one. I'm talking about the way we live, the way we work, the way we travel, the way we play, everything that we do. We have a global economy that's based on the maximization of the consumption of stuff in a world of finite resources. A third grader can figure that out. That's just not going to work uh, long term. Fossil fuel dependence, that's what gets all of, the, all of the press. That's what people talk about all the time is fossil fuel dependence. Well, the first two overpopulation and overconsumption of stuff drive that as we add more people more people eating higher on the food chain, more people driving cars. We, we depend more on fossil fuels. The problem with these three things is that they're not quick fixes. They're all above my job grade. I mean, think about overpopulation. I mean, most of it's happening in the third world, but it's still happening. Overconsumption of stuff. How do we change an economy so that we can all live here sustainably indefinitely? And fossil fuel dependence. All of those first three, I conclude, would take many decades, if not centuries, before the human, human species gets those under control so that we can, people that follow us can live here sustainably forever. Here's where the hope comes in. And I, people sometimes think I'm doom and gloom, but I'm really not. I'm a, I'm a half, half full glass kind of guy. And I always look for the, for the good in things. And in, in, and in this case, our food choices are the only thing of, on that list that we can change quickly. And it just happens to be the, the one change that can have the most impact on everything. It's such a win-win. It's a win-win for our health. It's a win for our planet. It's a win for the, our grandchildren. It's a win for those billions of animals and fish that get tortured. So, with that, I'm going to move back to heart disease, but I'm going to come back to that slide later because that's my favorite one. It, it enables me to summarize everything in, one, in four little points. So, with heart disease, I'm going to introduce you to, to my friends, in case you don't know them, Dean Ornish on the left and Caldwell Esselstyn on the right. How many of you know both of those guys? Okay, so I don't need to explain too much about them, but... I have met those two guys as well and consider them friends. In both cases, these, these are prominent individuals who have successfully reversed heart disease. They've done scientific studies. They've done controlled scientific studies. And they have proven that heart disease can be reversed in over 90% of the cases. Now. And I just said that, so. Um, oh, and both have influenced Bill Clinton. Um, Wolf Blitzer mentioned, mentioned both of them on the air in 2010 after Bill Clinton started, started going vegan. And later they were both interviewed by Wolf Blitzer on, on the air and they both talked about it. So they've had, they've had all of this great exposure, but yet our medical system still doesn't acknowledge and teach, teach future medical doctors that 
that uh, heart disease need, need never exist. That's what Esselstyn said. He says, heart disease is a toothless paper tiger that need never exist, and if it does exist, need never progress. So, at, what I like about the Esselstyn portion of the studies, uh, Dean is more famous than Esselstyn for several reasons. One, he was on the cover of Newsweek in, in the 90s for, for helping, trying to help Bill Clinton learn how to eat better. Didn't work back then. But he was on the cover of Newsweek and he got a lot of attention back then. Uh, and his, his, his studies were not just about food, they were about more lifestyle things, exercise and yoga and meditation and food. In Esselstyn's case, it was diet only. He took 17 patients from the Cleveland Clinic uh, that had basically could not be operated anymore for heart disease. In his home, with his wife, he taught those patients how to eat. And those 17 patients, prior to his intervention, had 49 total cardiac events in eight years. The intervention that he did consisted only of, of diet change. No other lifestyle changes. He said, if you're doing exercise, keep doing it, you know. But I'll, if you've got too many variables, you can't tell which one is really working, right? Now, since then, Dean Ornish's program has been approved for Medicare, but not Esselstyn's. And my theory on that is that, is that Dean Ornish has got four or five different things going on, and so the government could hide behind the fact, well, it's not all food, it's all these things. If they said it was all food, then they implicate the mighty meat and dairy industries. And I ran that idea by, by S one day, and I said, so what's the deal on this? And he's, he, he's a very modest guy that doesn't take shots at anybody, and he said, well, I, I think you might be on something there. <laughs> so, so 11 years after his intervention, he and Ann in their home, not a single cardiac event from those 17 patients. So that's 49 to nothing. That's a pretty good football score. Then you got the uh, Norway data supporting both of these interventions, both of these uh, medical doctors. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this Norway data, but prior to World War II, this is heart disease, basically deaths from heart disease going up steadily in Norway, just like it was in all of the countries that eat meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. Then the Germans came in, took over all of their livestock, didn't have any livestock for dur duration of the war, and so guess what? Look at the mortality rates drop down. As soon as the war was over, 1945, when I was born, boom, it goes right back up, started right back up where it was. So this is a whole country as a laboratory, which I think uh, totally supports the work of, of these two fine doctors. So why doesn't the world hear about these things? It just seems criminal to me that when you got a, a, a messenger like Bill Clinton, who everybody can see he's, he's healthy, a lot of people don't like Bill Clinton, a lot of people don't like his wife, but everybody knows his name. But here's what's wrong with our, with our system, our disease care system. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and they are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. Uh, said a different way, and this also applies to cancer and all of the other diseases. I've gone on the websites of all of these American Heart Association, Cancer Society, diabetes. You can't find anything about a whole food plant-based diet. They'll give it a little lip service and say, oh, you should have a little more, more plants in your diet. But they never say eliminate animal-based foods. That is not on any of these sites. So here's what Shannon Brownlee said. We have a disease care system. We have a very profitable disease care system. And it's actually, if they really were honest with itself, it doesn't want you to die. It doesn't want you to get well. It just wants you to keep coming back for care of your chronic disease. So, moving on to climate change. November 2006. This report came out from the United Nations FAO group. And, and it found that livestock causes 18% of climate change, 18% of greenhouse gases. 
a greater impact than all of transportation combined. They said it also causes much land and water degradation, and, but they did not recommend how to fix it. They recommended more efficient uh, production techniques for, for raising livestock. So they, they basically had no, they wouldn't dream of recommending that we stop eating meat. So that same year, 2006, uh, Al Gore came out with a movie called Inconvenient Truth. And I saw that movie in, uh, in July. This report came out a little bit later. Al Gore did not mention food as part of, of what drives climate change. And I know he had to know about it, even though this report hadn't come out. And so it was that movie and this report that basically inspired me to kind of become an activist. <laughs> and I started a little website called HarmonyEarth.net. And I did that for about five years, and then I wrote a book and kept going. Now, climate change, remember I said 18% was what they concluded in the official report. This is, um, this is Robert... Uh, Robert Goodlin and Jeff Anhang. Now, I never met Robert Goodlin. He died in 2013, but I did communicate with him. I did attend his memorial service at George Washington University in, um, in Washington. And he, he, he is the World, World Bank uh, environmentalist. He was the first environmentalist ever hired by the World Bank, and he was there for 23 years. And he wasn't a foodie kind of guy. He wasn't a vegan. He didn't, you know, he, he was overweight. And, but he started studying what was going on. And he, he printed the truth. Uh, this is the title of the, of the study, Livestock and Climate Change. This came out in 2009 by Robert Goodland and Jeff Anhang. What if the key actors in climate change are cows, pigs, and chickens? And in that report... They accounted for a lot of things that the other researchers did not account for. And one, one big thing was deforestation. When you, when you take out the forest, you get a double whammy. You, you remove all of the ability to absorb all that excess CO2. At the same time, when you take it out, you release billions of tons of CO2 at the same time. So that wasn't fully accounted for, that, that particular aspect, because... Deforestation takes place because you've got to have a place to raise animals or raise food for the animals. We're burning down rainforest in, in, um, the, in the Amazon region to grow soybeans to put on a ship to ship to China to feed pigs. So Robert Goodland, in September of 2013, at first he had said, all we have to do is, is take 25% of our meat calories and switch them over to plants. Well, he said that in 2009. Well, I knew that wasn't going to work because you give somebody a low target and they're going to not hit the low target. They're going to hit lower than the, the low target. But by 2013, four years later, he said there seems to be only one remaining pragmatic way to reverse climate change before it's too late. And that's by taking quick and large-scale actions in food agriculture and forestry. He didn't say you had to stop eating meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. He kind of took a big picture view of what, what really needed to be done. Well, you see how we're doing with our fossil fuels. Oil is at the top of the chart there, coal in the middle here, and then natural gas. By far the three biggies, and all three of them continue to go up. Um, The fact is that, as I said earlier, in order to, to solve the, the fossil fuel problem, we need a lot more than 10 years. We need, we need probably decades before we get that done. And I'm concluding that if we, if we tackle what we're eating first, we can buy some time. I'll talk about that later. This is a three-minute video that I want to tell you about that I'm going to show. It's a silent video. I'm going to narrate it. But it, it shows levels of CO2 that are taking place since 1979 and then it backs up and and show this is this is where it starts right here 
below 340 parts per million. 350, right about here, is where the scientists agree that if we go over 350, that we're in trouble. If we go much above 350, we're in big trouble. And so this, this starts, and I'll, I'll explain what's going on after we start the, the video. All right, they call it the pump panel video for a reason. These are, this is Mauna Loa, Hawaii. This is the South Pole. And this is the Northern Hemisphere. All of the, these are the data points on this chart up here, which you probably can't see. If you want to find this graph yourself, go to hpjmh.com. It's on the top of the home page right now. So look at what's happening. This is the clock moving along here, 1988, 1989. Look at, look at what's happening at the South Pole. It's, it's going up and down slightly, but it's barely moving, but it's definitely going up. So why do you suppose this is going nuts over here? That's the pump handle. This is where all of the, all of the excesses are taking place. The Northern Hemisphere, for the most part, is what's really pumping it out. And so look, th these, these numbers go way up in the Northern Hemisphere. They come back down. It's a cycle. You can see the cycle from high to low, but this is the graph as it steadily goes up. We've got half of the members of Congress that think this is a hoax. I mean, if we can't get our own government leaders on board because they figure they can't get elected if they come out and say this is real. It, it's just, but, but I like, I'm a data-driven guy. Dr. Clapper yesterday said he had a sign in his office, said it's the food. I've had a sign in my office for 25 years. It says, in God we trust. All others must bring data. <laughs> and, and here's some data. I mean, look at this thing. It's going up. It's up at 390. That's 2012. It hit 400 for the first time in 2013. It ended up here on the South Pole. There, now it's still going. Look, look, look at what's happening now. The graph is going backwards. And they're showing where it was in 1970. Now it's going to go backwards for 800,000 years, but it's not going to take as long as you might think. This video is about over, but watch, it's just about to shift here. Watch this. Going back to 1600s, 1500s, pre-industrial era, 278 parts per million. By the way, look at this over here where we are now at 400, and we're saying 350 is our maximum safe haven. So this keeps on going back, and it goes all the way back to the Ice Age, and to me, that, just, just show me the data. And it's so visual. This is put out by NOAA. This isn't some, this is National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency of the United States with collaboration with every country in the world. You can see that if you watch the video. At the end of the video, it's got a list of all those countries. So that's it. I just wanted to share that. I, I just added that this week because... It's so visual and, and it's something you can show to people. If you, if you can't find it, just Google, Google pump, handle, pump Handle 2014. It'll come right up on YouTube. So I've got four points here on this slide. Goodland Anhang and, Anhang and Hicks. By the way, I've gotten to know uh, Jeff Anhang pretty well over the past few years. He's still working on this. Goodland died. <laughs> probably because of heart disease. Um, in 2009, Goodland and Einhang said we need to replace 25% of our meat and dairy calories with plants. So well, that's all they did was say it. Got to do more than say it. 2013, they, they changed it because nothing had happened between 9 and 13. So they said, oh, we need to replace 50% of our meat and dairy calories with plants. And by the way, they didn't say whole plant-based foods. Because any plant-based food is good for the environment. If you want to be healthy yourself, you've got to eat the whole, whole plant-based food. But if, so some people are environmental superstars, but they don't eat a very healthy diet. They just don't eat the animals. So in 2016, which is this year, I wrote a paper back in April, and that's on that same website right at the top with the, with the graph. I said, we need, to, we need to shoot for 100% and hope to get 80 and we need to do it pretty quickly because the climate change tipping points are approaching. 
So that's the, the picture on the front of my 12-point uh, report, uh, twelve-point report. So I want to talk about water scarcity now, and I want to feature Lester Brown. Anybody heard of him? A few people. Lester Brown is the founder of World Watch. He's written 40 or 50 books. This one is one of his most recent, Full Planet Empty Plates. He grew up on a farm in New Jersey. He and Colin Campbell are about the same age. I did meet him in Washington when I went to Robert Goodland's memorial service. I also met the head of the UN Agricultural Group uh, at, that, at that meeting. In a nutshell, basically, he says this is the single biggest problem we have facing humanity is water because it's, it's, it's happening now. We've got a one billion people that don't, don't get enough water. We've got two and a half billion that don't have enough water for, for sanitation. And it's getting steadily worse all the time. We can, we can live without oil, but we can't live without water. So how do we solve the water crisis? Well, it's just like with the global warming. We look for things like bathroom and kitchen, you know, shorter showers and that kind of thing. Uh, we look at swimming pools, water in yards, washing cars. But you don't hear this from your environmental groups, just like you don't hear it about climate change. How about this? More of this, less of that. It doesn't say you've got to be vegan. It just says eat a whole lot more of this and a lot less of this. Uh, so where can we save the most, most water? I've got the... By the way, I, I created this example for a sixth grade class. I, I've spoken to a couple of them over the years, and I wanted to make it real simple for them. And so I said, how about eating more whole plants? And if you, if you put the score up there, it's 15 to 1. We can get more done with water, saving water, by shifting to a totally plant-based diet than all of the rest put together. It's like 15 to 1. Domestic use of water is only like 5 or 6%, yet that gets all the news. Oh, yeah, you've got to slow down your swimming pool and this and that. Most people don't have swimming pools. One thing we could do is charge for water. How much is water worth? Well, it depends on who you ask and how thirsty they are when, when you ask them. But if you buy it in an Evian container at an airport, it's probably 10 or $15 a gallon. But... Uh, if you just charged one cent a gallon, if you charged the beef industry one cent a gallon for the water they used, that $5 hamburger would cost $35. Now that would slow down some desire from people that can't live without their burgers. This is uh, Lester Brown again about, about our aquifers. There's 18 countries that, that, that are home to over half the world's population, and all 18 of those countries are over-pumping their underground aquifers, and their fossil aquifers, it means they don't recharge themselves. Once that water's gone, it's gone, and, and we're just recklessly going about doing that. So a couple of points on the big picture about water. Um, Interestingly, there's always been the same amount of water on the planet. For millions of years, there's the same amount of water. And we just kind of use it for different things, and we never had an issue with having fresh water until the last few decades. It's starting to get really important. The location of that water is very important. Is, is it in the underground aquifer? Is it recharging? Is it, is it in the billion, inside the bodies of billions of animals? That, are, that we're feeding for our beef. Right now, there's one billion people affected not getting enough water. So my conclusion is a dietary shift is imperative if we expect to solve the water crisis anytime soon. Now, I'm going to shift to cancer, and I'm going to feature Dr. T. Colin Campbell. That's the first image I ever saw of him. That was him in China during the the massive China Cornell Oxford project where he was the overall director from Cornell University and this is my new friend Dr. John Kelly who is the uh, general practitioner in Ireland that wrote the book Stop Feeding Your Cancer and he and I are currently writing a book called uh, Downsizing the Cancer Industry 
by publicly sharing the science behind cancer's favorite food. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Colin Campbell. I, by virtue of doing research for this book, I, I kind of learned his story a little bit better. In 1968, Colin was on the faculty of Virginia Tech, and they sent him to the Philippines to work on a problem of malnutrition among children. So everybody thought that all the problems with, with diet was all about protein, and the whole world should be eating the top quality protein like we do in the developed world. And so, naturally, that was his initial thought going in there. He was raised on a dairy farm and all this. He gets there, he has this amazing observation. The children of the, fa of the wealthier families had the greatest incidence of liver cancer. And he's saying, that doesn't make any sense. It goes against everything I've ever been taught. He, he, uh, he said, I've got I to find out if anybody's done any more research on that. So, at, in 1968... Maybe while he was in, in um, the Philippines, he researched the data. He found that there had been a study done in India by a few researchers. And they had studied laboratory animals, and they had concluded that they could turn cancer on and off by adjusting the concentration of animal protein in their diet. And it was an obscure study that nobody was talking about. Nobody reported it. But Colin said, my God, this is too amazing to have two things happen right here in 1968. This is three years before Nixon declared war on cancer, remember? So that was a, that was a changing point in his career. The mainstream assumption in 1968 and still today, what causes cancer in rats also causes cancer in humans. Colin asked somebody sitting next to him on an airplane, one of his fellow faculty type members, I think he was from MIT, he told him about these two observations, and the guy said, you know, Colin, you better watch yourself here. This is crazy. There's no way that could possibly happen. Those Indian researchers probably got the, got the labels on the cages mixed up in those rats, and he says, for God's sake, there's no way animal protein can, can promote cancer. So Colin knew, I've got, I've got, I've got a, a big deal on my hands here, and my career is at stake. But being the man of total integrity that I know Colin to be, and a smart man, he said, I'm not going to just give up on this, but I'm also not going to shoot myself in the foot. So he takes the next 10 or 15 years, he did 25 animal studies, in the lab. He did an additional 25 lab studies testing the same things. And he wanted to find out what's going on. I asked him recently, I said, Colin, after all of that study, when did it become, and, and scientists never say something absolutely happens. You know, it's always, you know, couched with uh, percentages, likelihood, and that sort of thing. He said, I became abundantly convinced in 1983 that animal protein is very much a part of promoting cancer in animals and probably the same in humans. But he, he wouldn't say that it, that it was definitely. He went public finally in, in 2005 in the China study and he, he told a lot of things in the China study that, by the way, it sold over two million copies. Just one of them was, was Bill Clinton, and somebody probably gave it to him. He said, cancer is not natural. It's not just a, an accidental kind of thing. Uh, most cancers are preventable. He called casein the most relevant carcinogen ever identified. And I'm surprised he hadn't been put in prison for that. But uh, I will talk about this a little bit later. He has been somewhat put in prison. Because once he started producing reports and publicizing reports and putting it in a book, uh, th things that implicated the meat and dairy industries, his career took a nosedive. He sacrificed his career to tell the truth. And in the book, I ask, we ask, why is there only one nutritional scientist in the world that, that uh, is telling us these facts or these, this theory. 
And the short answer to that is your career is over if you don't step in line with who's paying the bills. And it, it happened to Colin, and, and I've kind of been around to see some of that. Um, he also said the U.S. government should be telling everyone that diet toxicity is the leading cause, the leading cause of cancer. Now, John Kelly... Uh, has never met Colin Campbell, I think, until this past summer. But he, some, well, a friend of his told him about the China Study book in 2005, right after it came out. John Kelly was a, a medical doctor, family physician in Ireland. He's about the same age as Colin. They're, they're, they're around 80 now. Colin's 82. And so he read the China Study, and he couldn't believe it. I mean... He couldn't believe what he was learning about cancer and about those rats in the laboratory and, you know, there had been no human studies. I mean, we're going back to 1968 when the first animal studies were done. The cancer industry, even after Nixon declared war on cancer, no one ever conducted a human trial to determine whether camels' findings in the lab were, were applicable to humans. So Kelly said, my goodness, this is crazy. So he went to people that he knew as other physicians in his practice. He went to oncologists that he knew, cancer doctors. He, he tells me today, Kelly does, that he doesn't think a single oncologist in the world has read the entire China study. And what we talked about in our book that may never be published for reasons I'll tell you later at book signing if you want. But... Uh, this, this book uh, that we're writing basically is, is saying that the cancer industry is not looking for a total cure to cancer. They are money driven, they're a business, and they're looking for treatments that will go on forever. It's, it's now over a trillion dollars, it affects the economy now, and it's, it's going strong, and that's what's happening. In Kelly's work, he said, well, if I can't get the oncologist to do this human trial, I'll do it myself. And he had lots of patients in his practice, family physician, that also had cancer and were going to their cancer doctors. And so he, he told them, in his, and they were all friends of his, they all loved him, he was their family physician. He said, look, read this book and do this. Do it for one month. He just said animal protein free, and he even said they could have a little bit of fish if they needed it. But he just wanted them to do it. He said, just do it. And he said he would have preferred that the oncologist did this study because it would have gotten much more attention from the mainstream news. He couldn't do that, so he said he would uh, do it himself with his patients. When his patients would, he also recommended... He, the patients kept going to their cancer doctors. He didn't change anything. He just wanted them to change their diet and see what happened. They went to their cancer doctors, and some of them told their cancer doctors about this diet they were doing. They were told, you're wasting your time with that. You know, that's, the, that's the reaction from throughout the cancer industries to anything like this. And that's what's so frustrating to people like me. So Kelly's track record... In, in the 10 years or so that he did that, he's now retired, he had 70 patients that stayed on this diet. Cancer patients. 70 cancer patients. Not a single one has died except for uh, one with pancreas cancer. He, will ex he explains that in his book, Stop Feeding Your Cancer. You, can get it, you can't get it on, um, uh, in print anymore, but... And that's the issue I'm having with publishing this book. He's got a problem with his publisher. But you can get an e-copy for like 10, 10 bucks and have it immediately. So, 1971 and 2016, the war on cancer. Nixon, I did a blog back uh, a few years back when uh, the war on cancer got to be older than all of America's military wars combined. The war on cancer. And we're no closer to finding a cure because no one's looking for a cure. They're looking for treatments. So now we get Barack Obama and Joe Biden this year. And I saw that on the news and I said, damn it, this is a golden opportunity. We need to jump on this big time. And so I wrote a total of six 
letters to Biden's office. I also wrote one of those letters was to the, uh, to the ambassador to Ireland because Biden was going to be in Ireland and I was hoping that, that he would take time to meet with Dr. Kelly. Uh, six, six reaching out. I sent one of those letters, went, went on an 18 by 24 poster board. <laughs> it got returned when it arrived by uh, UPS. And so I, I had them resend it, USPS. You know, you don't get things like that delivered to the White House. They wouldn't accept it at the White House. But they accepted it if the United Postal Service was carrying it. I got two form letter responses. And in this, in this letter, every letter I wrote, I had this question. In the 11 years since the China study was published, why hasn't the NIH or any other cancer research organization conducted a sim single human study aimed at determining if Dr. Campbell's lab findings were transferable to human cancer patients? By the way, we're now raising money to do that, to do that study. Uh, as a board member of the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies, uh, we make money based on this course that we give in plant-based nutrition, but we're also seeking out don um, donations from wealthy individuals who are believers in Colin's work, and we're doing the best we can to, to uh, get, that, get that launched. It, it's going to cost about $6 million. Now, $6 million sounds a lot, like a lot of money to me and maybe to you, but the average cancer drug costs $2.5 billion to get to market. So it's not a really big deal. Now the, the, the Biden's group just published this last week. The Blue Ribbon Panel came through with all of this information and not a, only one of them offered any hope that they might say something about diet. That's number seven. Well, they didn't. Basically they uh, said the, the, the same old garbage about uh, possible causes of cancer. Now, so far today we've kind of, what I call, covered the tip of the iceberg. We've covered two diseases and two economic, e e ecological issues. There are many more diseases and there are many more ecological issues. Things like world hunger, collapse of civilization, future of the human species, and so I want to run through this pretty quickly. This is, uh, that's the College of the Holy Cross. I spoke there early this year. I spoke to a, to a class, uh, undergraduates, and it was a psychology class. And so it's what I call mainstream. You know, you got your, your vegan groups and vegetarian groups, and you got your mainstream groups. And I, I try to package my presentation for the mainstream because that's, that's who we got to get to. So... Sharing the big picture. And so how do I get my message to the, to the, to the mainstream? I'd, I'd start out by establishing some common ground. Do you, do, you like, do you care about your health, your weight, the way you look and feel? And I tell people, only raise your hand if the answer is no. Okay? Do you like a good deal? Do you like saving money on what you buy? Do you care about the environment, biodiversity, and sustainability? These are 18-year-olds I'm talking, or 20-year-olds. Do you believe that climate change is primarily driven by human activity? And do you care about the future of our civilization and the human species? And so no hands went up. I said, okay, that's 100%. We are in sync. Now, I'm going to pause here to say, I'm sometimes criticized for talking about doom and gloom. But I'm a realist and an engineer, and if you don't talk about the facts, you'll never get it solved. And so I just want to interject here and say our food choices give us hope because it's the singular power of our food choices to promote health, hope, and harmony on planet Earth. That's been my tagline for about the past 10 years. So. We're going to play 20 questions here, which I did with the class at Holy Cross. Did you know that on a per calorie basis, foods made from animals require over 10 times as much land, water, and energy as do foods made from plants? 
Did you know that it takes about two football fields worth of land to feed one person the standard American diet? That football field is at my alma mater, by the way, Auburn University. <laughs> War Eagle. War Eagle. Yeah. Uh, on the same amount of land, you could feed 14 people the diet, uh, the plant-based diet. And what happens, you could feed, with six billion football fields, you could feed three billion people the standard American diet. That would leave four billion people who would be left starving to death. So, did you know that you don't need, did, you don't need to eat any animal protein to be healthy? Most medical doctors won't tell you that because they haven't been taught that. But Ornish and Esselstyn will tell you that. Did you know that there's a lot more diseases other than heart disease and cancer that are, that are caused by eating meat, dairy, eggs, and fish? Did you know that you can save up to $5,000 per person per year? Now, I base that on my own self. Man, I was saving 5000 so some people could save more. But as a single man, I was eating out at least one meal a day at, at dinner. So when, I, when I'd get a meal for $10 instead of $15, i am saving $15 every day. That's, that's almost the $5,000 right there. So now, this, this is one that we were just talking about early, earlier. Did you know that in the USA we generate 113 pounds of manure per second? 1.78 billion tons a year. So if you're a meat and dairy consumer, your personal share is worth about 12,000 pounds. 48,000 pounds a year if you have a family of four. That's 48 half-ton pickup truck loads that might arrive at your doorstep on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Merry Christmas, here is your share. I say holy shit. <laughs> Did you know that over 20 million acres of rainforest have been destroyed per year since 1970, and most of that was going to, to raise animals. Twenty Over 20 million acres. I verified that recently with Dr. Openlander, who knows more about this than I do. Did you know that I mentioned the double whammy of reforestation, question number eight, is that when you destroy the rainforest, you throw up all this CO2 into the air and you remove the, the rainforest, which absorbs the CO2. So it's a huge deal to wipe out your rainforest. Did you know that uh, climate change, that, that, that uh, eating, eating meat, dairy, eggs, and fish causes more global warming than, than all transportation combined. Number 10, did you know that scientists agree that the tipping point for climate change will happen in between 2017 and 2020, if it hasn't already? And did you know that replacing most of our animal-based foods with plant-based foods is the only pragmatic way of reversing climate change? And we can see, oops, we can see how we're doing again with the fossil fuels by trying to eliminate the burning of fossil fuels. It's just not going to happen anytime soon. We also have a water crisis now. Did you know that half of the world's population depends on water and food underground aquifers that cannot be recharged? Did you know that we will eventually have to learn to live without oil, coal, and natural gas, but we will never learn to live for more than a few days without water? And did you know that from, I call the, the rainforest the lungs of the earth? Well, the oceans are the arteries and the heart of the earth. Did you know that the coral reefs are disappearing around the world and that they may all be completely gone by 2020? There are many things that affect the coral reefs. According to Greenpeace, global warming is the number one thing. In addition, did you know that our oceans are suffering from acidification, warming, dead zones, and rapidly declining biodiversity? Did you know that many of the problems of our oceans are driven by our food choices and fish consumption? And then, number 19, did you know that our food choices, uh, this is part of a chart that I showed a little bit earlier, are the only way that we can make dramatic changes quickly? And, and people say, well, how are we going to do that? 
you know, it's, uh, there's, people aren't going to change what they eat. Well, I've got, a, I've got a plan. I've envisioned a plan. It may not work. It may never happen. But at least I'm thinking about it. I'll share it with you in a few minutes. Food choices are special. Uh, they, can, they can be done quickly. They're the only one of those four that can be done quickly. Now, number 20 is my, is my favorite. This is a recent data point that I found published by the people at the, uh, at the Global Footprint Group. Carrying capacity. Okay, we got one Earth, and it, we're not going to be on Mars and the moon anytime soon. So we got one Earth. We're, we're growing our population like crazy. What, 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 what is the carrying capacity? Well, it depends on how you are living. If the average person, if everybody in the world tried to live like the average European today, that means the diet, the lifestyle, the transportation, everything rolled into the European lifestyle, carrying, carrying capacity is two billion Europeans. Gets worse. How about if everybody in the world tried to live like the average American? We have a carrying capacity of one billion people that can be sustained indefinitely the way we are living. Now that's a sobering thought, but we're not gonna give up hope here. We're gonna move on, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back a little bit and give you a little history. About four billion years ago, we humans emerged as a species about 200,000 years ago. So we wanna put our, this is for the sixth grade class, Put our time here in perspective. We, if we crammed all four billion years of life on Earth, that the Earth has been supporting life, into just one year, we humans have been around for 26 minutes of the last hour of that year. Now look at what we've done in 26 minutes. Well, we've, we didn't, they didn't care much about us, you know, for the first 199,800 years that we were around, but it took us that long to get to one billion. In just 200 years, which is basically two seconds of that last year, we went from one billion to seven billion. And in the, in the course of doing that, we went from this to this. If, uh, if you wanted to describe Earth, if you were passing by from another planet, this is kind of what you would see, like, my God, what are those people doing to their planet. So here we are, back to my four questions again. Uh, so if you don't remember anything else, you know, there's just four things. And I, I defy anybody to tell me that those, any of those first three can be done anytime soon. Uh, with overconsumption, with fossil fuels, listen, people all over the world are starting to eat meat, dairy, eggs, and fish and drive cars for the first time. For every American or European that's moving in the direction of a plant-based diet, there's 10 people in the developing world moving the other direction. And I, I got that from extrapolating some United Nations numbers. Now, I'm gonna, there's two books that I, that I call big picture books. Uh, this is the other one, 10 Billion by Stephen Emmott. It's a one hour read. This man could be one of the smartest, most knowledgeable people in the world. I met him in London. Uh, in 2013. He is the head of computational science for Microsoft. He runs a, he teaches at Oxford University in England, in London, and he runs a team of scientists for Microsoft that spend their whole lives running around measuring processes and checking on trends and, and all of the above. And at the end of his book, it takes you one hour to read. It's, it's pretty thick, but it's, it's got a lot of stuff. It's just one, one sentence on a page, stuff like that. He said, I'd like to think otherwise, but I don't believe we're going to make it. And his last four words have a curse word at the end, and I think we're blanked. But uh, I won't say it on, to the rest of the world. I mean, Stephen may be listening today. So I asked Stephen, I met him, we had about an hour and a half in London, shortly after this book came out, and I said, do you think we have a chance if we could get 80% of the world's 
two billion wealthiest people to cut way back and replace 75% of their meat, dairy, and egg, fish calories with plants. Do you think you'd change those last four words of your book if that were true? He said, I can't tell you if that would happen or not. I'd have to do a lot of computation. That's what he does. But he said, I can tell you it would be one enormous, enormous positive contribution to the environment of the world. Stephen Emma. I call it a book for leaders. Book hasn't done that well. Most people don't like to read bad news about their good habits, about their bad habits. So. But uh, I call it a book for leaders because leaders don't get much done if they don't work on the most important things first. And that's, that's why I call myself the big picture guy. I try to identify what that is. This is the real tragedy, tragedy in what I have been studying now for all these years. Michael Pollan said it best in the Cowspiracy movie. I think they've, uh, why, and, and what he's saying is, why don't Greenpeace, Sierra Club, and all of these organizations tell us about the environmental, horrible environmental, unsustainable impacts of the way we eat? He said, I think they focus grouped it. It's a political loser. They're membership organizations. They're looking to maximize the number of contributions. And if they get identified as being anti-meat, it will hurt their fundraising. I mean, some of these CEOs of these organizations are getting paid more than a million dollars a year to not tell us the most important fact in all of the, of, of the history of the world, in my opinion. I think that's fraud. I think it's criminal. And it's just disgusting to me. We've got some more hurdles out there trying to sell the plant-based diet. Humans have always eaten meat. That's what I hear. They eat meat in the Bible. What about calcium and osteoporosis? I can't live without my burgers. Forget it. Too expensive to eat a healthy diet. I beg your pardon. I save $5,000 a year. It's not convenient to eat this way. So I got a quick slide for the last two. That's a $6 meal at the local Chinese fast food magic walk in my shopping center in Stamford, Connecticut. Six bucks. And it's, it's what I call a four-leaf four leaf meal. It's mostly plants. So here's a recap of what we get if we eat mostly plants and not animals. 90% less water would be used to grow our food. 90% less land would be used. 90% less energy. We could return this farmland to forest. We slow down climate change. We spend 80% less on health care. And we end world hunger. For God's sake, who could not be for that? How about these guys? How about these guys? How about our Congress, for example? Not a win for everyone, lots of money at stake, trillions, trillions of dollars. So I'm getting to my plan in a minute. By the way, this is, I mentioned four leaf. This is, this, is a, this is a tool that I use to communicate how we should be eating. I don't say vegan or vegetarian because vegan doesn't necessarily mean a healthy diet, as you know. But four leaf is over 80% of your calories from whole plants. One leaf is over 20%. Even at over 20%, people are getting four or five times more whole plants than they get from the standard American diet. This is based on Colin Campbell's definition. The closer we get to eating a diet of whole plant-based foods, the better off we will be. So I just made this up, and I put it in my first book. And we now have uh, a four-leaf survey, and you can identify how well you do on the four-leaf scale by taking the four-leaf survey at fourleafsurvey.com. And it's also on my website at fourleafprogram.com where we have the four-leaf survey now in seven languages. And by the way, the four-leaf four guide is being translated right now into, into Chinese. We'll soon have the book in Chinese. So the, the survey asks you a bunch of questions. It asks you three questions about fruit, veggies, starches, and, and one about omega-3s, three questions about dairy and eggs. You can only get positive points up here. All of this is negative points. We also try to keep the fat less than 20% in the four-leaf four leaf approach. Uh, so I, I'm getting to my plan now, and I've got a few minutes left, and I'll take questions after that. But the plan that I envision as an engineer and a business executive all of my life is we got to work on the most important things first. 
And the single most important thing is what we are eating as a world population. And it's mostly 2 billion people in the five regions of the country that are eating 72% of the meat. We work on the demand side of the equation. We change people's eating habits by promoting uh, why they need to change what they eat. We go directly to the people all over the world, different languages, but most of the languages we already have in our survey, and we have uh, Portuguese and German and, and a lot of, lot of languages and, and uh, Spanish, and we do it with credibility and repetition. There's a term in advertising called effective frequency. First time you hear about a new product or new service, you don't even listen to it. Fifth time you begin to think, what is that all about? And, and depending on the product or the change they're trying to get you to make, it could be 50 times before you believe it. But eventually you start believing it if you hear it enough times from credible people. So I think it's a matter of leadership and money. And I've been spending a lot of my time trying to identify the kind of leader that could pull this off. And I was just telling Steve last night, it only takes one to really get, if, if there's one powerful billionaire leader that's got global name rep recognition out there that has the conviction of doing this as much as I do, problem is pretty well underway to getting solved. Leadership and money. Now, how much money would it take to have a massive global awareness campaign where we, where we tell all of this to, to everyone? Uh, so I'm saying, well, maybe it costs $5 billion. I make up a number, $20 billion. Well, guess what? Facebook just bought WhatsApp, an app for $22 billion. An app. Most of you don't even know what it is, right? I have it. I use it to talk to my co-author in, in Ireland. But, I mean, $22 billion. If, if an app is worth $22 billion, what's the future of humanity worth? You know, so we want to educate, motivate, and legislate in terms of, of my plan, or my vision. We want to reach the top two billion people in the world. They are in China, Europe, United States, Brazil, and Russia. Eat 72%, this is FAO numbers, of all the beef, pork, and chicken. I believe you spend that kind of money and you get a, a, a leader in, inspired to do this, you can, you can you can start getting a lot of traction. International credibility, a leader that fully gets it about food, ready to lead full time and can attract other leaders and raise billions of dollars. So I've got some messengers here. Uh, I would think that Bill could be a leader, but he can't be a leader because he would never invest the time to do it. But he's a good messenger. Look at what he used to look like and look at what he looks like now. And this was in a magazine. Uh, that's Beyonce. I, I realized I didn't have a woman on here yesterday, and I quickly sought out Beyonce and put her in there. Pretty good messenger for plant-based eating, right? Look at what James Cameron used to look before he switched over, and he's a friend of mine. I've been to his home a few times, and he is amazing. Uh, you, he's been in the news a lot lately. The next two guys, I think these two guys, they're both multi-billionaires. They're both super smart. And I believe that either one of them could do anything they set their mind to. Do I think they're going to do this? Low probability. But this is the kind of person I'm talking about. And this is how I draw on my experience as an executive recruiter. I know what the job is. And so I know what kind of candidate I'm looking for and what kind I'm not looking for. Uh, I'm not turning anybody away. Don't, don't get me wrong. But uh, Elon Musk owns three companies. And he's got six kids when he's not busy at work, you know. He's, uh, Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. He's, he's out there. Bet you don't know this guy. He's the co-founder of Napster and the first president of Facebook. And he's worth $3 billion. And he just gave $250 million to Joe Biden's moonshot team. $250 million. Now... I've watched some of his videos. That's what I do with these guys. I watch their videos and I kind of get a feel for their personality. This guy could be the one. He's 36 years old, he's got an open mind. Uh, so Colin and I are in the process of trying to get a meeting with him as we speak. What's his name? Uh, his name is Sean Parker, S-E-A-N. Uh, so here's the Harmony Project, I call it, recap. Replace MDEF with plants. 
four-leaf system for teaching, leadership, and money to conduct a massive, never-ending global awareness campaign. And then you might say, well, what can I do? Well, look at, look at Steve Shore over here. Look at what he's done. You know, every, everyone, I think, I think anybody that has conviction here should do what they can do. In my case, I'm a business executive, problem solver, engineer, headhunter, so I'm best suited for doing some head hunting. Right now I'm hunting for Sean Parker. <laughs> you have to choose whatever your, your inspiration is. And then this, uh, this is my vision of harmony that can take place. As people everywhere begin to learn the truth about their food choices, millions will start replacing most, if not all, of their animal-based calories with healthier and greener plant-based alternatives. As we begin working on the demand side of the equation, markets will quickly respond, people will begin getting healthier, the cost of health care will plummet, water will become more plentiful, trees can be planted on the freed up land, and our fragile ecosystem will begin to heal. Eventually, we must also deal with overpopulation, overconsumption, and the excessive burning of fossil fuels, but those tasks will take many decades, if not centuries. Taking urgent action now with our food choices can buy us the time we need to address them all. Quickly, the story of Easter Island. This is the way it looked when the human settlers arrived there in 500 AD. This is the way it looks now. And what happened there was they didn't associate, they didn't connect the dots with their lifestyle choices and their ecosystem. And they went to a population, they were settled there. It's the most remote place on earth. It's 2,000 miles off the coast of Chile. And they didn't have any trading partners, but what they had was trees, and they had fish, and they had birds. And, and the biggest problem, I think, they, the historians say, is, is they deforested the place, building boats and houses and whatever they did. They built those, those stone gods. Some of those things averaged 12 to 30 feet, some of them as much as 80 feet tall and weighing 80 tons. I mean, these this are amazing people. But what happened was, was they didn't connect the dots, their ecosystem collapsed, they pretty much went extinct as a species. Uh, they were up to 15,000 people, let's see, on an island just a little bit smaller than Santa Catalina off of California, 60, 63 square miles, I think. The Dutch settlers discovered them on Easter Sunday, 1722, and they called it Easter Island because it was Easter. And there were about a couple hundred of them. They were, I think, human-like people scurrying about trying to get food. I mean, it was every man for himself. And that, my friends, is what is happening now on our Easter Island. We only have one. And it's not like they were. They, they should have been able to figure it out. Everybody's there on one little island. Here we've got all these countries involved and all these religions and everybody believes something different in different languages. It's not an easy thing. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this right now because I'm out of time and I want to take any questions. But if you catch me later, I'll tell you about me being the self-appointed committee of one. I now have two. Kathy's joined me in promoting the candidacy of T. Colin Campbell for the Nobel Prize. And I've been writing about it. Colin is modest about it, but he does appreciate it because he knows while it's highly unlikely it'll happen, if it does, it would be huge for the movement toward plant-based eating. And this is what uh, Colin's alma mater now has uh, in front of their food science building which is paid for by PepsiCo and other people like that in the dairy industry. It's just horrifying to think that that, that is happening in our schools of nutrition. Huh? That's a milk jug at Cornell University. Colin drove me by there one night. He had to show it to me. He said, can you believe what they have done? So do we have a chance of pulling this off? Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens, me and Kathy, can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has, Margaret Mead, and my favorite. People who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. Steve Jobs.
This is my car. I'm a registered Vermont voter. And let's get rolling with four leaf. I got it on my license plate. And then finally, how important is this topic? And I consider myself working on the most important topic in the history of the world. And I consider my clients are the children of the world. My children, your children, everybody's children. We can't leave this mess with them. These are my seven grandchildren. That's it. It says here I've got eight and a half minutes left. Kathy has a question. The study? The study that you and Campbell are going to do on the, or you're trying to raise money to yeah, do? Yeah, uh, we've, we've uh, Dr. Campbell and his son Tom, you may know of Tom, he co-wrote the China study, he's now an MD, and he is in a position to lead, lead a study, I'm not going to mention the details of where or anything like that, because Colin doesn't want me to, but basically Ideally, I think we'd like to have 300 people, 300 cancer patients. 100 of them are the control group. They're told just to keep doing what you're doing. Just come back in and we'll measure your stuff and that. And the second group is the intervention group. And they are told to eat a 100% whole food plant-based diet. And we will provide them with the food, I think. I think that's, that would be the ideal plan because it's really hard to, to monitor people. The only way we could monitor people is put them in prison. I don't think we, we can do that. We could do it in a prison, maybe. So that's two groups. Five-year study and measure what happens to their cancers. The third group, which may or may not happen, is a third group of 100 people that are basically following the camp that I am in. I don't want any of the treatments from the cancer industry. That's my personal choice, and I would rather die with dignity then suffer my final few years. And there's a lot of people like that out there. And if you're not one of them, it's a, it's a personal choice. I'm not criticizing anybody. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do everything I can to prevent it. But this group of people, there's 100 people that have refused. So the first two groups are randomly assigned. There's 200 people. And you get to go in one group. You get to go in one group. And so people have to sign up knowing that they might have to change their diet. But this other group... That's not randomly controlled. They, they have chosen, I'm not doing the, doing the cancer stuff. I'm not going to go to the cancer industry with my problem. And so, wouldn't it be something if the third group, eating whole food plant-based diet, did better than the intervention group? You mean, just did the food and not, not do the treatments? We all know chemotherapy is, is killing, is not doing your body good in terms of your immune system and radiation and all the things that are being done in the interest of um, calling it, you know, treating cancer. So that, that's the kind of a nutshell. Uh, first, I just wanted to say thank you for your talk. I'm also doing a quick search on the 10 billion. It looks like they've made a documentary out of that as well. So it could be a convenient way for 10 billion? people. Yeah. Good. Um, my question is, um, you said that you had sent some questions over to the NIH. I, did I hear you say that they actually responded? No, I sent, uh, I sent six letters to the Joe Biden uh, Moonshot Cancer Initiative team in Washington, D.C. And I have gotten two form letters after six letters. Form letters go out to everybody that wrote them that month. They don't mention anything that anybody said in the letter. We just really appreciate your input and thank you for being a part of the team and blah, 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 blah. We asked for a, a meeting with Dr. Campbell and Dr. Kelly and to come get outside, uh, Colin calls it the, the cancer castle. If you're not a member of the ca cancer castle, they don't want your ideas. But Colin is an unusual person. I, I asked Colin uh, a few years ago, I, I mentioned earlier about why no other nutritional scientists have come out in favor of what he's talking about. And I asked Colin, Colin, how many nutritional scientists are there in the world? And he estimated there were 10,000. I said, Colin, out of those 10,000, how many do you know of that have seen your work in your science and are supportive of what you're doing and believe that you are right, you're on the right track. 
He said maybe 10 or 15 people. I said, how many of those 10 or 15 people have published an article or published a study or come out in the newspaper or anywhere and supported it? And guess what the answer to that is? Zero. Zero. Now, that's a sad, a sad commentary on academia. And uh, I, I recently posted chapter 10 of the book we're writing, and you can find it on my HP JMH website. It's, it's like the, it's called Money Control Medicine, I think. And it's, it's a, I think it's just, uh, there's, the last 50 blogs are in the right-hand column, and you can find it pretty easily. Uh, it's 5,000 words. It's, it's long, but I wanted to, I couldn't publish the book anytime soon, so I wanted to get that out there. Hi, thank you for that amazing talk. Um, you mentioned that for every one person that's moving towards a plant-based diet, right. that there's 10 moving away from that. Yep. So could you um, expound on what what do we do then if that's 10 to 1? doesn't sound too good. Well, we're talking about the people in the developed world. Uh, like China now eats twice as much meat as we do as a nation. The per capita is nowhere close to us. They eat more, more pork than the rest of the world combined is eaten in China. So in the past 20 years, China's, China and India are kind of what we're talking about here. That people have started having jobs and making money, buying cars, and getting Americanized. I mean, we've got all of our KFCs and McDonald's and Burger Kings all over the world, and they want to eat like Americans eat that they see in the movies. And that's happening all the time. And so we think because we're all educated and, and eco-conscious and all of this that things are getting better. Well, they're getting better in Santa Monica, California, but they're not getting better in Saigon. You know, it's, it's just a different story. And what do we do? Uh, I get back to, to the global awareness campaign where we're going after the, the leader countries, the U.S. and all the European countries, and Australia and, and those places, and, and we, get, we get the momentum shifted in the other direction, so it's just like it's not cool to smoke cigarettes now. Guess where they took the cigarette smoking? Uh, I think there were, there were one billion people died of, died of cancer in the past hundred years. It's, it's, it's skyrocketing for the next hundred years because the developing world is smoking at a much higher rate than, than we are. So, but we're the leaders. And, and if, if smoke is not cool here, it'll eventually not be cool other places. Same goes with someday, someday eating, eating animals should be a crime. It won't happen in my lifetime, but it should be. You mentioned 20% less fat. And Kathy and all of us, we're saying no oil and no well, sugar. No, How I do said, you mean? No, I mean, my definition was 20% of, maximum of 20% of your calories from fat. Now, right. the average American gets 40. Esselstyn, the cancer, the, health, the heart doctor, he, he keeps his patients below 10. And he says, no oil, no oil, no oil. And no avocado even, no, hardly any nuts. Well, you know, uh, I'm just trying to make it palatable, for lack of a better word. And if, if you're eating four leaf, 80% of your calories from whole plants, and keep fat down to, down to below 20, you're by far in the top 1% of the healthiest eaters on the planet, without a doubt. Even if you have... Have a, a, you know, I will have something at a party. I don't really know what's in it, but I'm starving, and I have a little thing they pass around, and it might be, oops, I just ran out of time. <laughs> okay, any other uh, questions or comments? So uh, I would take this final few seconds to introduce my grandchildren. Up there at the top is... The firstborn grandchild, I can always remember her because she was born in the year 2000. So she just turned 16, sophomore. And she's a uh, state competitive skier in Massachusetts. This is her baby brother who, who was born last year, his, Lucas. This is Peyton. This is three of my grandsons, Colin, Cooper, and Andrew. 
And my daughter in Atlanta has two little girls, Violet, Violet Lucy and Evie Laura. And someday, I've written a blog about them. I wrote a, a fictitious blog about the year is 2065, and the Hicks grandchildren got together for a meeting, and they said, you know, Grandbuddy was right about all this shit. <laughs> <laughs> but if you write a book, you're, you're documented, and your grandchildren can, they can find out what you were talking about. So the blog may get, disappear if, if we get cyber attack or something, but the book is out there. It, it's in print. And my eighth graders can understand it now. By the way, there's only, there's only two of them that are eating the perfect diet. This is Andrew, who is an adopted grandson because my son married his mother. But he eats nothing but four leaf. And he is the healthiest one. He's the only one that doesn't get sick. He's the best athlete of all the boys. And his name is Andrew and Sarah Hicks. And his, his father died, and, and my son met his, his mother. And then uh, Lucas is the son of my, my son and, and his wife, Lisa. And from the womb, that boy won't have any meat until somebody tempts him in junior high school to, to have a burger. But uh, he's also very healthy. I will say that my daughter, she's married to a hockey player in Atlanta, and he likes his meat and potatoes, but my daughter does the grocery shopping. <laughs> and she, those two little girls are both in preschool. Uh, she's in the first grade now. And they eat ten times better than any other kids that, that she sees there, although they do have milk in their refrigerator. And the other three, Peyton, Colin, and Cooper, live most of the time with their mother, and she doesn't buy in. And so that's a shame, but my son has finally gotten over it, and I said, look, Jason, just, just give them time. Someday they'll pick up my book, and by the way, my son's, my son's name is on the cover of this book. Uh, he didn't do any writing, but he was a big part of my support team, so I put his name on the cover. Uh, and by the way, Colin Campbell did not write the foreword. Uh, he said he was too busy to read a book before he would write a forward. And so I went to Nelson, who I knew really well, and I said, Nelson, uh, if I send you a copy of my, my uh, manuscript, uh, would you read it first? And if you like it, would you consider writing a forward for the book? And he said, yes and yes. And now I know the next question is, will my father sign it with me? And I said, that's exactly right. <laughs> And he said, you want to list his name first, right? And I said, I do. I said, but your name will be on the cover in the same size font. So he said... No, Colin, Colin has uh, one L and my grandson has two L's. But uh, Colin called me right after uh, Nelson had written the foreword, before the book came out. It was New Year's Day and he says, Jim, I just... I just looked over this manuscript. Nelson told me how good it was. And he says, you know, you, know, I, you know, I didn't exactly write that forward myself. He said, but I want you to know I agree with every word of it. <laughs> I brought a couple of copies of that book if anybody's interested. Thank you very much for your enthusiasm. You're a great audience.